So our technology is actually a modular solution, a modular synthesis unit, which can be built uh, in our headquarters in Karlsruhe or at other places. It can be pre-manufactured and these modules can be brought very, very quickly to the so-called sweet spots um, for power to liquid production. So wherever you build up like a wind park or where you have an electrolyzer already running, you can build up these modules which have a perfect technical fit to the electrolyzers. And by this, we are overcoming this, 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 this fallacy that you say, okay, first we need gigatons of green hydrogen. First we need gigatons of even green CO2 coming from direct air capture or whatsoever. But we can start right now. Welcome to Sustainability in the Air, the world's first podcast dedicated to sustainable aviation. I'm your host, Shashank Nigam, the CEO of Simply Flying. Every Thursday, I have important conversations with top aviation executives, technology entrepreneurs, and policymakers helping aviation take climate action. Conversations that help separate the signal from the noise. Whether you are a frequent flyer or an airline executive, if you care about sustainability or simply love traveling, welcome aboard. My guest today is Tim Boltken, the founder and managing director of Ineratech. Germany's Ineratech is on a mission to replace crude oil and achieve a carbon neutral climate. They are building a pioneering power to liquid plant in Frankfurt. It's going to be the world's largest power to liquid plant till date. They have received funding from the likes of Safran in France and have been selected in the uplink challenge of the World Economic Forum. In fact, Simply Flying will be leading a full-day immersion to Inertex facilities in Frankfurt very shortly. Meanwhile, you can learn all about power to liquid and how that will impact aviation in the future from Tim and my conversation. Enjoy. Tim, it's great to be speaking with you finally. Uh, it was not too long ago where I held in my own hands a bottle of Inneratex e-fuels on stage uh, together with one of your investors, Safran CEO Olivier. And I made a joke that, you know, I'm probably holding the most valuable piece of, you know, bottle of liquid in Europe right now, just by per milliliter. You are making e-fuels at Inneratex. Can you tell us in very basic one-on-one terms, how does this process work? What is the e-fuel? What are you trying to do here? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, really great to finally speak to you in person. Um, yeah, e-fuels are, I would say, liquefied electricity. Uh, so what we do is we produce these carbon neutral liquid fuels out of green hydrogen and carbon dioxide. So in principle, we just combine the two molecules, which are gaseous in its form, uh, to form a liquid hydrocarbon. And the liquid hydrocarbon can then be further refined into a diesel fraction, a gasoline fraction, or what you had in your hand, like a, a kerosene fraction, so-called SUF, sustainable aviation fuel. And uh, what we do at Aneratech, we are um, a tech developer and uh, we are realizing uh, the chemical synthesis units to produce this set fuel from green hydrogen and carbon dioxide. What's the story behind this? This sounds very complex. How did you get into this? Are you a scientist? What's your background? Uh, so the, the background is that uh, most of the founders are engineers. Um, so it's, of course, um, very um, technical driven. Um, so in, in the recent years, uh, in the past, before we were founded, um, we, of course, come from university, from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Um, a, a lot of decades, I think two or three decades of R&D uh, has been put into the technology. But um, we had a very solid foundation to start the company on Neurotech. And now a couple of years uh, later, so it's uh, eight years in the making now, we are one of the leaders in, in e-fuel production, uh, one of the technology leaders. Um, our headquarters in Karlsruhe, we are based, uh, we are approximately 150 people strong. And uh, we have uh, realized already a bunch of um, these e-fuel production plants. And currently we are building um, one of the largest uh, e-fuel production plant in Frankfurt, Germany. And I'm pretty sure we will touch base on this uh, also in the, in the later discussion. 
Absolutely. I'm going to go one by one here. Uh, in your earlier comment, you mentioned green hydrogen and carbon dioxide as inputs. These are expensive inputs. And, you know, regardless of e-fuels business, any business that has expensive inputs has very high costs. That's a lot of renewable energy as well. Where are you looking to get this from? What is this going to cost you? So first of all, uh, if we just look at the chemical process, we are feedstock agnostic. So we just need the molecules. We need the hydrogen and we need okay. the CO2. Or we need a different kind of syngas source. So um, our technology is comprised of as a technology platform. And in principle, we convert the gases into the fuels. So, But at the end, if you want to have a carbon neutral product, a carbon neutral fuel, uh, carbon neutral means um, when you burn it, for instance, in a turbine, you just want to release as much carbon dioxide at, as has been captured before. You need to look at your feedstocks. And so if you want to have a green product, you need green feedstocks. And for power to liquid or for the e-fuel production, this means using green hydrogen. So hydrogen, which is, for instance, coming from an electrolyzer, which is fed with renewable electricity. And also you need to look at the CO2 as a feedstock. So you can take Theoretically, you can take every CO2 you want, but we are also very closely looking at the CO2 source. And you are absolutely right. Um, currently, uh, the feedstocks are um, still um, expensive and they result in fuel, which is um, a bit more expensive than the fossil component. But we are heavily working on uh, bringing the production costs down. Um, so that we are in the range of today's biofuels and in the future where we are also uh, competitive with the fossil fuels. And this is, this is um, done in several ways. So on the one hand, of course, we work on CapEx reduction, but I would say the very major uh, leap forward you can do is uh, go into uh, to sites where you have access to very cheap green hydrogen, very cheap green electricity, and we do this with a very modular approach. Isn't green hydrogen a very scarce resource right now? And there are, there are, you know, arguments made by some parties that, hey, this scarce resource should go to other industries, which um, more people use because not a ton of people fly, for example. What's your argument for using this for e-fuels for aviation as opposed to other industries? Look, everything what is innovative at the beginning is scarce. So um, you can also go back to the first microwave. Uh, the first microwave would cost you like half a million dollars and uh, nobody really saw the application for it. And I think now you can buy a microwave for $30, $40 and you, it, is, it is put in every home. And of course, we need the ramp up of green hydrogen production. And of course, we need the ramp up of e-fuel production. And the same was true 20 years ago with uh, renewable energy. I mean, uh, everybody said 20, 30 years ago, okay, we need the green, uh, we need the green energy. We need the renewables. Where are they? So look, look which exponential growth we are currently seeing on, on renewables. And the same will happen for green hydrogen. So, and this solves the question for the scarcity of the products. What is it? What is it? What is it not solving? Is that, as you mentioned, it's scarce today. So, and how can we plan and invest into gigascale e-fuel production uh, facilities, which costs you a billion, when you have a scarce product? And this is uh, what we are solving with a modular approach. So we thought when or if the renewable energy production is modular. So we talk about PV modules, we talk about wind turbines, which are modular. And we talk about modular electrolyzers, modular fuel cells, modular batteries. Why should we talk about centralized e-fuel production, which looks like a refinery? So our technology is actually a modular solution, a modular synthesis unit, which can be built uh, in our headquarters in Karlsruhe or at other places, it can be pre-manufactured and these modules can be brought very, very quickly to the so-called sweet spots um, for power to liquid production. So wherever you build up like a wind park or where you have an electrolyzer already running, you can build up these modules which have a perfect technical fit to the electrolyzers. 
And by this, we are overcoming this, 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 this fallacy that you say, okay, first we need gigatons of green hydrogen. First we need gigatons of even green CO2 coming from direct air capture or whatsoever. But we can start right now. We can, we can go to the sites where we produce green hydrogen today, where we have a CO2 source. And by that, we can produce. And the more modules we bring into the market, we ramp up, the cheaper the fuel is also, um, uh, the, the cheaper the fuel will become um, until uh, we achieve price parity with the fossils. How long do you think we will, it will take to get price parity with jet fuel? I mean, uh, we, cannot, we cannot look into the crystal, crystal ball right now, right? But uh, if, if you uh, assume that we will see the same exponential growth, what we have seen in renewables, and the same drive be he, behind uh, the, 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 the financing guys, right? The banks, debt financing, equity financing. I think we will see these prices at the beginning of the 2030s. So I'm very, very optimistic that the prices will drop quite significantly. Yes, today green hydrogen is far too expensive, but also here um, we see that when you build up the electrolyzers at the correct sites, at the correct spots, you will be able to get the green hydrogen costs down. And I mean, look, today in the sweet spots like Chile or somewhere in the desert, you achieve off-grid uh, green hydrogen, uh, green green electricity costs of like one point five two dollar cents per kilowatt hour, and if you cr- translate that into your business model, that's that's quite attractive. So the the prices will go down quite significantly. I love the optimism, but I know there's a reality ground. This is grounded in reality as well. You mentioned that scale is important. You are building a large scale facility in Frankfurt. How is that coming along, and what's your intention there? So the intention is that uh, we started as a pure tech company uh, where we said we we have an amazing technology, we have the most efficient reactor technology, um, we can we can deliver the plants to the customers now, but still it has a trem- it it is a tremendous lead time until you have just sold the plant, you have built the site, and so on. And um, in the past, we have delivered the, the technology to our customers, uh, for instance, to Synhelion or to Atmosphere and, and, and a bunch of others. But then we thought, hey, why not build, own and operate the plant on our own and then become an e-fuel producer and sell the fuels? So the good thing here is that we um, have the decision in our hands. Uh, we can invest our money and um, we have a very good market understanding on to which prices you can sell the e-fuels. So this is why we... Um, invested in our first industrial scale we call it pioneer plant in in frankfurt uh, it's a it's a well picked site because we have already access to cheap green hydrogen we have access to biogenic co2 coming from a biogas plant and um, we will build here um, the the largest e-fuel production facility it's 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 a modular scale. It's you you said it's it's quite large. I mean, uh, after commissioning, the plant will have a capacity of two thousand five hundred tons of e fuel per year. This is something, but compared to uh, the fossil fuel consumption, it's still still very small. Um, however, we now see that our investment is paying off. Um, we are really a first mover in this market. We are considered in the market as a pioneer. The first units are already installed. Uh, commissioning is already uh, already done, and we will ramp up now step by step the production capacity in the next month to come. Wow, this is uh, quite impressive that you are ready to scale, and I'm looking forward to visiting the plant myself soon uh, with some airline folks and other aviation executives. The question is, once you make this e-fuel there, who's going to be buying it? Are there airlines that will be flying these e-fuels? So, as you can imagine, if you have a scarce product and everybody wants to have hands on it, um, there's, there's of course, uh, let's say, a strong traction on uh, the offtake of the e-fuels. While everybody is talking about SAF um, as one of the like airlines or, or aviation is a hard to abate sector, so they really, really need it. Uh, nevertheless, there are also other industry sectors which want to have the fuel because at the end, an uh, e-fuel production facility is not only producing stuff, but it's producing like a bandwidth of different products. So this crude 
we are producing in the first stage is comprised of like starting from a C5 to a C70, 80, C90 molecule. And with these molecules, you can go in all the different uh, uh, offtake sectors. You can go into road transportation, you go into maritime. Of course, you can go into aviation, but you can also go into the chemical industry. Um, the offtakes we have currently agreed on and are set are especially with customers from maritime, road transportation, and from chemical industry. Aviation is still a step behind um, because obviously there are customers who are willing to also pay higher prices for that. Maybe because uh, the thing is that um, they are not uh, having that high fuel costs in their in their opex of their of their own business. Um, but we see um, um, aviation as, as as one of the uh, markets of the future because they they need tremendous amounts. They have no other alternatives. Um, the the quotas are already set. They are rising from year after year. And at the end, these sectors also need to defossilize um, until 2050. And e-fuels are the only only option they, they really have on the long term. It's, it's very interesting. Why do you think airlines are waiting? You've, you've, you've got success with trucking. You've got success with maritime. Is it the cost? Is it the willingness? Do they not see the potential of e-fuels? It's a scarce resource after all. They should be running to lock these supplies in, isn't it? Yeah, I think there's 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 uh, uh, maybe a bit of like like hesitance uh, in the market, and um, uh, maybe also airlines are not so used to uh, take bold decisions fast. Um, nevertheless, what what we can see, we have we have strong partners from 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 aviation industry already. So one of our um, strategic investor is um, a corporate investor is Safran. So uh, you you mentioned you have met uh, Olivier uh, in person. So I mean the the um, the producers of the turbines they are already working on on the turbines that run on hundred uh, percent of these uh, synthetic aviation fuels. Uh, one of our investors is the Rock Creek Group. Uh, behind that is the airline Delta. So we see that um, all the airlines are positioning themselves already in this field, and they already know they they don't have a choice uh, in in the future than, than than taking it. I think there's just just a bit of like like hesitance in in the market. And so what we do in the meantime is uh, there are also other sectors we can can sell the fuel to. And um, they potentially have also a higher willingness to pay. And I mean, especially in the beginning, you, you greatly accept this. I think it's a matter of time, especially as the new mandates in EU come through for airlines, then they have to think, how do you go beyond HAFA, for example, in 2030 exactly. and beyond? Exactly. What, what, mentioned... what really, yeah. uh, and adding here, what really worries me a little bit is that there were a lot of announcements uh, in the e-fuel sector and in the biofuel sector on SAF. Now we see some 180 degrees um, decisions on, on large uh, oil players, uh, which are stepping out of production capacities. So I, I'm not calling it like a soft crisis, but I, I see this actually as a tremendous chance uh, because the projects are announced. The project will be realized. Um, we can step in with our modular solution. And at the end, it's with everything. I mean, you just need to come back stronger on, on, on the subs. And as you said, the mandates are there. So we, if you have it, if you have it, the airlines, they have to take it. Full exactly. Stop. You mentioned uh, two of your partners. Well, actually, you mentioned Safran as, mm -hmm. as a partner. You've also got investment um, and partnership with NG and Synhelion. Mm -hmm. How do these work? What is the nature of these partnerships and how do they help you? So on the investor side, NG or NG New Ventures is one of our investors. So um, if you want to disrupt a, a field, especially um, the fossil industry, you need partners. You cannot you cannot do it alone. And uh, what we were always looking for is have, of course, financially capable, but also strategic partners and corporates on board that help us in different sectors. Because at the end, what we are doing is we are we are coupling the sectors of electricity and fuels. So we make out of an electron a molecule. 
So we need a very good understanding on the molecule level. So how you bring the, for instance, the SAF into the market. Here, Safran is a very good partner. But on the other hand, NG is a very good partner upstream. I mean, NG has a renewable energy policy. They are also building uh, green hydrogen projects. Um, we are very active uh, now in, in France, um, where we are building the, the, the next the next project. And here, having having a French uh, partner, like a strong partner like NG, is, is of, of incredible uh, value to help you understand the market, to help you understand the cost structure, to deliver the PPAs, the guarantees of origins, or even the direct connection to the renewable energy sources. So there are plenty full of, of, of opportunities how to collaborate. And um, um, uh, Synhelion is, is, is a great partner uh, on the commercial side. Uh, so our team is really, really proud to have played a very crucial role at Synhelion's project Dawn. So where they have built up the first really solar to fuel plant where we are not using an electrolyzer. And you mentioned uh, initially, how do we get the costs down? So one option could also be that you are utilizing different gas sources, so where you're not using an electrolyzer. And where Synhelion is very strong uh, in is uh, generating a sun gas out of a hydrogen, uh, out of uh, water and CO2 in their uh, solar towers. And what we delivered was the, the fuel synthesis uh, part. Um, so where the sun gas is going into, into our uh, technology and then our technology converts the sun gas into the fuel. And uh, that's that's a very, very uh, interesting and also a promising project. And we are also here looking forward to the to the next step. This is so interesting. I wonder how you would scale this, Tim, because you're doing this as a pilot plant in Frankfurt in Germany. Yet, if you look at growth markets, and I'm coming from an aviation perspective, right? Yeah, um, if you look at growth markets, they are not necessarily Western Europe or even the Americas. Growth markets are India. Turkey, Indonesia, Philippines. How do you bring your technology to be ultimately, I wouldn't say necessarily deployed, but at least be used or be of benefit to growth markets for aviation like these? So let me try to answer this question from uh, first from the tech angle. Um, so if you look at uh, wind energy, so what what is what do you think is the 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 the, the, the largest commonly used wind turbine, which is deployed. I'm not sure. It's five to seven megawatts. So that's the usual yeah. scale of a wind turbine. So, and the renewables were so successful because they were modular and you can export it in all the different, in all the different countries. And the same holds for our technology. So we built up these modules. And um, of course, before you can export it into these growth markets and before we build up such a unit in India, in Turkey, in wherever, you want to de-risk it. So it's it's high tech. You want to build it and you want to test it. And this is what we are doing in Frankfurt. The good thing is we don't need billions for doing that, but we need millions. So And once you have reached this milestone, you can actually de-risk your technology. It becomes bankable. And especially debt investors or, or yeah, debt financiers, they are very used now to this uh, business models from the renewals. So meaning once you have the risk of technology, you can easily, easily export it. And the second step, what we are doing, this is very important for the growth markets where you maybe have not access to a very, a very nice electrical grid like we have it in Germany. Um, I mean, the same could be said also for the US uh, where maybe the electrical grid is a bit shaky is the application off grid. And uh, here we have one very, very big asset that um, our technology is load flexible. So we are load flexible like an electrolyzer, like, like a renewable energy source. So the future might hold uh, that we will um, um, also install our units uh, really off grid. Um, then we would definitely go to the sites where you have like um, a, a quite high capacity factor on re renewables. But this is where you said it's Turkey. It's India, it's Australia, it's the US, it's Chile. So it's 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 really like a global global solution to build up this technology. And the good thing is we don't have to make like a first initial investment in India where you need to to find uh, the, the capital for it. But you have already de-risked your technology, and it's about 
the risk you're having is entering the market and you are de-risking the, the technology also. Fantastic. I, I love the windmill analogy and how it's modular and easy to transport and easy to scale. Yeah. Are you looking to build these yourself globally or are you looking to license the technology like Lanza Tech, for example, and work with local partners in building these? I mean, we, we will we will do our best to go into the gigawatt scale very fast. And gigawatt scale means building thousands of these these modules. So of course we are looking for strong partners. Um, on the on the production side, we have teamed up with uh, Samsung Engineering. So also one of our investors. Uh, they are one of the largest EPC. They are used to uh, um, uh, execute. Uh, projects worth billions of dollars and um, they are manufacturing globally. So um, that's, that's, that's one chance uh, we are seeing uh, similar to today, battery industry, even car industry, right? Where you, where you build something and export it. Um, the other point you have mentioned is of course, licensing. Um, yes, it's, it's a huge opportunity to also license the technology out. I mean, we are very IP driven. We have core, core patents on the reactor technology, on the processes and so on. So there's the opportunity for licensing it out. It's currently not on the agenda. Uh, currently is, uh, Inertec. We want to be the player who's delivering the units either for our third party customers or for our own SPVs. Um, so that we are really building globally the, the, we call it the oil field of the future. And with every ton of e fuel we produce, we substitute one ton of, of fossil crude and we leave it in, in, in the ground. This is very ambitious and very exciting. This, of course, requires a lot of funding. And uh, you have announced closing 100 million euros of funding. How far? Well, firstly, congratulations. <laughs> I think Thank it's you. a big feat. There are very few um, technology startups in the sustainability space that have crossed 100 million. So well done on getting there. Um, how far do you think this will get you? What? How will you use this money and what does this allow you to do? Yeah, so so the capital was raised in a in a quite challenging environment. Um, let's let's hope for the best, especially for the for the climate, that um, also good other players and also we in the future receive receive funding because in climate tech and in the climate industry this is like heavily needed. Um, before the money goes into consumer businesses, it should go into into uh, into uh, hard tech and, and climate tech. Because at the end, I mean, that's what we see with the current blockchain hype. I mean, you cannot blockchain climate change away, right? Um, and the same holds for AI. You, you, AI will not solve our climate problem. It will actually just increase the, the re, re, renewable energy capacity we need to build up. Um, that said at the beginning, um, on what we do with the money is actually now bringing a narrative to the, to the next scale. We will now professionalize it. Um, we are, we are still seeing ourselves as a startup. We are organized as a startup in a very positive way, but we are currently uh, professionalizing our structures and this is what the money is for. So, and in parallel, we are also preparing um, um, other funding rounds, uh, not equity, but, but other funding rounds to, um, to, to finance uh, the upcoming projects, which are in the pipeline, um, which are in Europe, which are in South America, which are in North America. Uh, we see um, also Australia, MENA, Japan, East Asia. These are all markets which are currently pulling uh, tremendously. And of course, um, executing on all of these projects requires a lot of capital. Um, and the more we de-risk the technology, the less we have to raise on, on, on corporate level, but the more you can, can work with uh, debt financing and with, with other projects. I mean, uh, we are here based in Europe. Uh, so um, also with the European Investment Bank, you have strong partners. We have banks that are aligned and, and very interested to, to, to be one of the uh, pioneers themselves to, to finance these innovative business models. And uh, But last but not least, our full focus now is on the Frankfurt Hoes plant, bring it up and running until the end of this year and also then welcoming you over in, in Frankfurt. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the plant in person indeed. As you scale, I wonder what kind of decisions you will have to make. Will you need to think about, oh, um, you know, renewables are cheap in Chile. So do we go there first ahead of, let's say, a strong growth market like Turkey, for example? Or how do you decide that 
biodiesel can be sold today, where, whereas aviation mandates come in, you know, five, 10 years from now. So how do you prioritize where to scale and how to scale? In, in theory, you could, you could philosophize and discuss about these uh, strategies from day to day, um, because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really multi facets on, on these things. The good thing here is that, um, realizing these projects, you need to have a long, long breath, so to speak. So you, you cannot like, like reorganize and reprioritize. Um, them uh, anytime. So based also on our partners, and this is why we carefully selected them, um, the, the next steps we will do besides Europe are um, South America and North America. So these are the, the countries and the, the areas what we see as, as very promising. And uh, now it's about uh, not to get distracted uh, distracted on the multitude of opportunities you're having, um, but actually focus focus on your initial plan um uh, get the funding uh, raise raise uh, the project finance and then execute on the projects where you have decided uh, you will you will uh, go first and um i mean some opportunities sometimes arise i mean southeast asia is also like a growth area and um there's potentially also uh, the chance for a couple even of of dozens of of plans in in, in the next uh, years but yeah, uh, focus focus is absolute key. I think that's a very important point, especially for technologies looking to scale. If you keep your focus, you can you know repeat what you're doing well rather than be distracted and that's spread right. out too thin. Um, one question around technology pathways: Have you considered methane as well, methane to SAF or methane to e-fuels? So in principle, uh, yes. So our technology is, is, a, is a platform. Um, it's comprised of, I would say, different building blocks. Um, if we talk very deep technology, we can say if we want to go on the fissure trop fissure pathway, we need to have our own syn gas creating source. So this can be, if we start from CO2 and hydrogen, it can be the reverse water gas shift reactor. We are also having a kind of CPOX technology, um, which means you can have a methane containing gas as a feedstock and create yourself a syn gas. On the synthesis side, uh, we are not limited to a fisher tropic end products. Um, we have already the first projects um, in the pipeline on methanol production which is also uh, very interesting, especially as a C1 building block for the chemical industry. But also there's an alcohol to jet pathway, which which will be ASTM uh, compliant uh, soon. So this could also be a route um, to produce sustainable aviation fuel. And then uh, last but not least, we are also working on methanation. So where you can produce uh, synthetic uh, natural gas and then with that replace the fossil natural gas um, in, in the pipeline. So on on technology wise, with, with our modular technology, we are quite flexible on the uh, on, on the operations and on the applications. But again, here focus is king. So we see um, the, the 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 biggest demand and the biggest ch uh, chances currently on the Fisher Tropsch pathway, and this is why we are also heavily investing into this pathway in, in Frankfurt East. Glad to hear that. Really, really glad to hear. If you look out. Five to ten years from now, what does success look like to you and your team? We 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 have the we have the ambition to maintain our 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 head start we are having over competitors. I mean, at the end, it's a common goal to replace the fossil fuel with the renewable fuels. So internally, we have set this goal to transform one gigawatt of electrical energy or renewable energy into then approximately 125 million gallons of sustainable e-fuel by the 2030, beginning of the 2030s. Um, this is what we have defined as a North Star. Uh, we are really taking solid steps um, in creating these this fuels. But at the end, we know that it also comes down to our partners on technology providers on the upstream, on the downstream, on uh, investors to achieve that. But but our team here in Karlsruhe and in entire Germany and Switzerland and now starting also in the US is is working very heavily to to achieve these uh, achieve these goals. Fantastic! I do wish you all the best. Uh, this is quite exciting, Tim, and I love the progress you've made through this and like I shared uh, we will be hosting a simplifying immersion bringing aviation executives to your Frankfurt plant soon and I'm really looking forward to seeing the technology in person rather than just holding a bottle 
of the e-fuel. <laughs> you can hold a bigger bottle then or probably yes. also a barrel of it then. Yeah. I have to be very careful given how expensive it is right now, though the mm. costs are coming down. <laughs> mm. um, now, the final part of this interview is called the rapid fire round in which we get to know Tim a bit more personally. And I'll start with something simple. What's your favorite airline? Favorite airline? That's a tough question. Actually, I, I have none, right? So, I mean, um, it's, it's, uh, if I cannot, uh, if, if, if I cannot avoid to, to fly, then I will just take the one which has the best routes. Um, but I, I will not say something good or bad about any, any airline. Okay. You're not, you're not um, a million miler on a single no, airline then. No, no, no. Hmm? <laughs> I'm 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 the I'm the type uh, bicycle and let's try the best via teams and uh, then if and, uh, train is not an option then we need to fly. Sounds good. Uh, what's your favorite airport? Do you have one? It's definitely not Frankfurt. It's definitely not Frankfurt, <laughs> but uh, I would say uh, recently I, I I still love Singapore. Um, I, mm -hmm. I used to to study a while in Singapore. And oh, yeah, so I think I, I think that's that's still the best airport. It used to be my home airport growing up, so indeed one of the best. I recently heard that you soon can clear immigration without your passport yeah. in Singapore. So yeah. that's uh, amazing. It's always staying ahead of the curve. Favorite city? The first city I, I ever went to uh, without my parents was San Francisco. Uh, we have now a San Francisco-based um, lead investor with Piva and San Francisco. With, with all the troubles they are having, it's, it's still the most amazing city. And um, followed up by, by Cape Town, you see, I, I, I love the more the sunny cities. But uh, there's, a, there's, there's the life and the, the, the feeling you have when you enter the city. Indeed. Uh, Cape Town is absolutely stunning and very, very beautiful. Um, favorite movie? Fight Club. From teenage years, challenging status quo and uh, just breaking down everything and build up something. Okay, cool. Uh, that was a good, good answer. Uh, favorite book? Besides children books, uh, uh, when I bring my son into bed, I, I, I think that when I have uh, when I have time to read, I, I read a lot about like fallacies. Um, so um, this um, this guy Dubelli from Switzerland uh, has summarized like a lot of fallacies, um, where you uh, think you do something uh, on purpose and then you uh, do it unconsciously. And I, I love reading about these, uh, like the way how we behave, how we take decisions. Um, so, but it needs to be something which is digested in smaller chapters because currently there's not the time to read like several hours uh, uh, nonstop. <laughs> fallacies, very, very interesting. Does that help you discover fallacies in your own behavior as well, or do you just read about them? Uh, it's it, it helps me to discover, but I'm not as smart currently to also make use of it. So you, you see it afterwards that this was a fallacy, but at, at least I'm starting to understand it. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, what do you do in your free time? Being a father, being a husband, and trying oh. trying to to have my blood pressure under control. How many kids do you have? Uh, one and the second one coming. Oh, congratulations! Okay, thank you, thank it's going to get really busy very soon. You got a startup and a and, and a kid coming. Well done. So it's it's like three children. Then a startup <laughs> yes. a startup is the first one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. What is something you'd like to learn, him? Being, being more organized and structured, uh, personally, I'm, I'm very creative. I'm left-handed, left-footed. Um, I'm, I'm learning more about my own personality. Uh, I think I still can, let's say, bring myself into the next level when I'm uh, learning how to be more organized and structured. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Structure. Yes, we can always do with more of structure <laughs> in, in our lives. Uh, what is the best advice you've received? That's a tough one. I, I would say if it comes comes down to surround yourself with positive people and with positivity, uh, then mm -hmm. you can achieve a lot of things. If it's about surrounding yourself with negativity and toxicity, uh, you you will not you will not achieve the goals, uh, even if all the odds are in your favor. So right. cut the toxicity, to, uh, cut the negativity, and just uh, surround yourself with positivity. 
Yeah, that's a good that's a good one. The best advice I've received around surrounding yourself with people is in five years from now you'll be a you will be the sum total of the five people you surround yourself with today. So choose who do you spend choose wisely. With five people choose, yeah, wisely. choose wisely and and be ready to drop people if uh, you know that's not how you want to end up in five years from now. For exactly. Example. Yeah. Okay. Final question. If we are speaking one year from now and we are popping champagne, what are we celebrating? We are sub- celebrating that we have brought our plant in Frankfurt into operation, uh, that we have established all the uh, channels to the different fuels, uh, fuel routes. So I want to have filled an airplane, I want to have filled a ship, I want to have filled a car, and I want to have a carbon neutral product in my hand. And maybe I will also eat something which is produced from this carbon neutral food stock. So Ooh. as you see, the the opportunities are very manifold and we are happily working on it to get this done uh, in I, year from now. I cannot wait to pick up carbon neutral butter from the supermarket then. <laughs> well, good luck to that, Tim. And thank you very much. This has been a pleasure speaking with you. It has been a pleasure as well. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sustainability in the Air. Aviation is one of the hardest to decarbonize industries, yet there are multiple paths to get to net zero. Awareness is key to a green future. So please give us your support to help our sustainable aviation insights reach a wider audience. You can do this by sharing this episode on your network on LinkedIn, Twitter, or even WhatsApp. Or perhaps you might consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to this episode. You can start a conversation with us by writing to us at podcast at simplifying, that's simply with an I, dot com. And for more content on sustainable aviation, please visit our website green.simplifying.com and join the movement. Sustainability in the Air is an original podcast by Simplifying. The show is produced by Juraj Toth in Slovakia. Dirk Singer is our Director of Sustainability, who leads research for each interviewee out of Greenwich, UK. Shubhadeep Pal is our Supervising Editor based out of Mumbai and Singapore. The articles are written by Ayushi Badola in Dehradun in India and Meera Hull in Montreal, Quebec. Creative design is led by Lihia Esteve in Montreal. Baiba Dreamen is the project director for the show based out of Valencia, Spain. Special thanks to Wendy Sim in Singapore. And I'm Shashank Nigam, the CEO of Simplifying and your host. Please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn.